taking a look at the CNC milling machine here, you can see that at the top of the machine we've got this control box. On the front of the box you can see that we've got this no volt release switch. Now this actually switches the power on and off to all the stepper motor drives. And then next to that we've got an emergency stop button so when something goes wrong, as it always does, hopefully you can stop the machine quickly by pressing this button. And it's twister release. Looking at the control box side on you can see that we've got a grill here because sat behind that that's the main 24 volt power supply that provides all the power to the stepper motors. And also inside this box is some form of stepper motor controller and also an ethernet converter which converts from ethernet to parallel port because I believe that the uh, stepper motor controller in here still uses the old parallel port but we don't want to connect a parallel port to a computer because of course computers don't have parallel ports anymore so the actual output from the controller going back to the computer is on ethernet. Also on the back of the control box we've got a couple of rows of these aviation style connectors. Now the actual bigger connectors here, these are actually controlling, I think I've got it labelled up, so these are something like Z, X and Y. So these are feeding the, uh, the power out to my stepper motors. We've actually also got a couple of spare axes which I'm not using at the moment but should I want to add another axis I've got one available. I'm not sure whether it's A or B that's wired up which is one of those. And then we've got another row of slightly smaller connectors. Now these are connected to the limit switches for example and we've also got some auxiliary connectors which I'm going to be using for things like probing and detecting where the material is. And hopefully you can also see we've got another little socket tucked away here which is socket number five. Now across a pair of the uh, connector pins on here, across socket number five, we've actually got a relay contact output, a set of relay contacts closes whenever the spindle's energised on the CNC machine. So I'm hoping that we can pick up those relay contacts and we're going to feed them in to my mist control unit and that's how we're going to switch the mister on whenever the spindle starts up on the machine. And the box itself also takes 230 volts. And as I've just demonstrated, I did actually mount the controller on this swivel so that I don't actually have to root round at the back of the machine for making any connections. I can actually just turn it round as I've just done. I think it's quite interesting to see the way in which the enclosure for our control unit here, the way it's actually been manufactured because they haven't just used a standard panel. What they've actually done is they've constructed this unit using something called, well I call it 2020 rail. It's a slotted rail. And this is used a lot in industry for building things like prototype machines where maybe you want to build a mechanism of some kind, you don't want to build thousands of them. So what this allows you to do is create custom designs relatively cheaply. I say relatively cheaply because this rail is semi-expensive but it is very nice to work with. So you can see what they've actually done is they've built a skeletal framework here and then they've taken some material which I think what this is, I think they've used something called dye bond. Now what dye bond is, it's actually a laminate so we've got a piece of aluminium, it's just got some white uh, protective film on it at the moment but you can see it looks white on top but it's actually a sandwich, it's a laminate so we've got aluminium then we've got a layer of I think it's polyethylene plastic and then on the back side we've got another layer of aluminium so the whole thing is a laminate sheet and the way it actually works is they've actually taken this dye bond material and I think they've just sat it into this slotted rail like this. Now for my MQL system I actually want to build an enclosure that looks very much the same as this so that's what I'm planning on actually doing today. Before I build pretty much anything these days I like to model it first using 3D CAD and for those not familiar with the term CAD stands for computer aided design. There are three main reasons why I do this. Firstly it helps to ensure that for a more complicated assembly like this one it makes sure that we can see how all the parts fit together and we can actually check that the parts do fit together before we go ahead and make them. Another reason for using 3D CAD is that having drawn something in 3D I can actually output that to my 3D printer and print out the object and in a very similar way I can also take the output and I can use it to program the CNC milling machine. But I think one of the most compelling reasons to learn 3D design is simply because it is so much fun to do. There are several open source and completely free options out there. I think one of the most popular being OpenCAD. However the one that I use isn't open source and it comes from Autodesk and it's called Fusion 360. For commercial use there is an annual but relatively modest subscription fee. 
However, for non-commercial use, they do actually offer a licence for free to hobbyists like me. Now in theory the free licence does come with some limitations and some features aren't included. However, all I can say is it really hasn't been any kind of limitation to the kind of things that I do. I guess one of the biggest potential limitations is that in the future Autodesk may change their mind about offering these free licences to hobbyists. But once you've had some practice in 3D computer aided design, those skills are really pretty much transferable to any package that you may care to use. If you don't want to spend time modelling all these components yourself, you don't have to. You can go to websites like this one and have a look at the parts that other people have created. And that's what I'm doing here, looking for a fuse holder. After downloading the part and just dimensionally checking it, it is the one that I want, I go ahead and add it to my library of parts so I can use it any time I want in the future. In last week's episode you saw me making a printed circuit board and I did that using some software called KiCad. And a very nice feature of KiCad is that we can output a 3D model of the printed circuit board and that's what I did and I've imported that into Fusion 360 so we can take a closer look at it. And that really is a very useful feature when you're trying to do things like align a printed circuit board into its enclosure, especially if you've got lots of cutouts of things like switches and potentiometers. It looks like I've about finished designing the enclosure for my coolant control system. So let's just give it a final check over before we go out to the garage and actually make it. So then we've got all our 2020 rail cut. I've had the Evolution chop saw for about the last six months and I'm glad to report that I'm really happy with it. It's done everything that I've asked of it and all these pieces of 2020 rail have been cut to within about half a millimetre and I'm sure with a little bit more practice I can actually do a little better than that. Regular viewers will remember that a few months ago I bought this Axminster bandsaw. But for those playing along at home, let's just have a look. It's the AP1854BV model. Now I think the V stands for Variable Speed Control. And the reason that I actually chose to buy this particular bandsaw is because not only will it cut wood, as my old previous bandsaw would, with the right blade it also cut steel, aluminium, a variety of other metals, ferrous and non-ferrous. But in order to do that, we need to put the correct blade on. Now, we never actually had a go with this bandsaw because I'm interested in cutting metal rather than wood. So I've gone ahead and I've actually purchased the right blade. And looking at the packaging, Axminster Tools and Machinery, catalogue number 505226. It's a GT bandsaw blade, 73 inch or 1854mm times half inch and it's 10 TPI. So it's got 10 teeth per inch on the blade. Now, I've never installed one of these blades on this bandsaw before. Uh, haven't read the instructions. Let's see how it goes. Now, I guess the first thing that we have to do is uh, get this cover open, which is some locks on the side, if I remember correctly. That's one. Okay, that opens up quite nicely. We have this material support disc here. I'm sure that's got a name, don't know what it's called, but it goes around the blade. I'm going to have to take that off to get the blade out. Okay, just getting a feel for it. Right, okay, let's release the blade tension. That's the tension of the blade. Of course, as you can now see, I'm wearing gloves. No, to self, probably should have put the gloves on before, but I haven't cut myself so far, but let's face it, it would have been the sensible thing to do, wouldn't it, to have put some gloves on. I'm 
guessing the purpose of this is to keep the table completely square to actually align the two halves because it's got this saw cut through it maybe there'd be a tendency for one side to slip so I think this is some form of alignment I'm guessing the old bandsaw didn't have one of them from fear we can just get this laid out now there we go out now there is actually a knack to folding bandsaw blades like this but it is a little bit of a knack and uh, I need to watch some YouTube videos because I've tried to do it in the past and I can never do it so uh, if you, again if you guys can give me some recommendations on the easiest way to fold these bandsaw blades up you could do that I tend not to fold them up actually I just find somewhere to hang them up in the workshop because again I do think folding them up and unfolding them is a bit risky but of course they do take up a little bit of space just to hang them up like that. When you put a bandsaw blade on you've got to of course put it on in the correct direction there's a number of ways you can actually get it wrong but actually what you want to do is you need to have the cutting teeth here you need to have them pointing down towards the table so before I did put the bandsaw blade on I did actually check that So I've got a handle here and what this handle does is we've got a mechanism which actually allows me to raise or lower this top wheel and that applies tension to the blade, in fact you saw me undo it before in order to get the blade off. Now some bigger industrial bandsaws that I've used in the past, there tends to be a spring under here and I've seen some that have got an indicator on them that helps you set the, the blade tension. Now I've got to admit I'm not exactly sure how to set the blade tension on this machine what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and set it somewhat like it was before just notice I forgot to install this blade scraper I assume I just have to push this in so I'll do that You can probably tell I'm not particularly expert on this machine, I haven't really used it as yet so we're having to do the learning together so almost certainly I've done something wrong, that's what the comments are for, tell me of a better way of doing things and I'll try and do that next time. There's an assembly of bearings and rollers here which are actually designed to support the top of the blade and there's actually another set of these rollers which are underneath it, now sometimes when you've changed a blade, particular a blade that's got a different width or a different type of profile sometimes you have to readjust these these guide assemblies but what I'm going to do first of all is I'm just going to run the machine I'm just going to see what the blade does so you can see the guide bearing on the left here it's just touching the blade but it's barely making contact with it that's okay but on the right side of the blade hopefully you can see we've actually got quite a big gap there so I think we'll just try and adjust the guide. That's good enough for me. Is Big Track, the computer activated truck from MB Electronics. Program in up to 16 commands and Big Track will advance, turn, and fire three blasts. Big Track follows its instructions and can maneuver around every obstacle to complete its mission. Program it and Big Track obeys. Well done, Big Track. Big Track from MB Electronics. The next job we're going to do is program the CNC machine to cut out the holes in the front and the back panels. And the CNC milling machine that I have, you can really just think of it as a big track. And all we have to do is give our CNC milling machine a list of simple instructions such as go forward, go backwards, go left or go right. It really is just that simple. To help us write that list of instructions, we're going to use the computer aided manufacturing tools that have been built into Fusion 360. The first thing you have to do in programming the CNC is describe the stock and also to define an origin on the part from which all the measurements for our cuts is going to be taken from. After doing that, I'm going to select the first tool that we're going to use. 
which is actually a spot drill which I'm going to use just to put a centre mark on the front panel which our bigger drills are going to follow later. The maximum spindle speed of my machine is just 2000 RPM so I've got to adjust that. And then I go ahead and I select the holes which I want to drill. I'm setting the depth now of how deeply we want to drill into the material which is only a short distance because this is just a spot mark. And to check that I've got everything correct I'm just going to do a quick simulation. And what we end up with is a list of instructions for our CNC machine to follow and they call those instructions G-code. And with that done, let's go and shoot the dog. Having set the tool to the bottom corner of my work, I've now got to zero the X and Y coordinates because that's where the cutting is going to be datum from. That'll do. Let's zero the Z. I've changed out our centre drill for a standard 3.5mm twist drill. I've also gone ahead and I've datum this tool so it just touches the work surface and then zero the Z axis. So in theory this drill should go all the way through the work this time. slower than I need to because I've never used this material before and I also want the machine running enough to try and catch it if something goes horribly wrong. You can see we've got a mixture here of plastic swarf which is the centre of our sandwich which is polyethylene and that's sandwiched on either side by some very thin aluminium. The next job was to install this 5mm slot drill into a collet, put it in the harbour and then do the milling. Unfortunately I've just found out that the smallest collet that I've got is 6mm whereas my tool is 5 so I'm going to have to do something really silly that you should never do. I'm going to actually install this milling cutter in a normal drill chuck. Now you shouldn't do that because a drill chuck isn't designed for milling operations. It's not really rigid enough. But I'm taking very light cuts. I'm hoping we're going to get away with it. But don't do what I do. Of course what I should do is go out and buy a 5mm collet. Can't do that tonight. All the shops are shut. Let's see if we get away with it. Well, all I can say, fingers crossed.
As we saw really the main part of my enclosure is going to be assembled using this 2020 rail and this 2020 rail really is just like Big Boy's Meccano. I don't know if you've seen it before but it is really useful stuff it's very easy to put together and because everything is so carefully machined it's just very very straight and the actual dimensions of it are pretty tightly controlled so when you build something to a size it does stand a good chance of fitting together. Now the other advantage is, is you can buy off the shelf a whole range of different accessories that will help you assemble this 2020 rail for whatever kind of project you happen to be doing. Hopefully because I bothered to put all that effort into 3D modelling this project it should all fit together nicely or certainly that's one of the advantages of uh, 3D modelling. Well that's the idea anyway. But of course as people often say about computers, garbage in, garbage out. So it's only going to be as accurate as the models I created which I know some of them weren't absolutely perfect but I think they'll be good enough. So you can see that this dye bomb material that we're using it does come with this protective film on it. That's why I was happy to scribble over the top of it because I knew it would just come clean when we peel it off. Yeah, so this material is pretty much dead on three millimetres. I think my slot here might be five or six. Let me double check. Okay, so my slot is six. So unfortunately, this piece of dye bomb material is actually going to float around a little bit in the channel here. I wonder if I can use another piece as a packer. Hmm, no, of course size for size doesn't quite fit. So I am going to have to find some way of packing these channels out just to take up that bit of a gap. But I'm going to figure that out later. I don't think that'll be a big deal. I suspect I can probably just go ahead and 3D print something which will just push down the back of the channel and just fill the gap. So I've got that to do. You can see that I've got this piece of wood on my bench and that's because this piece of MDF material it is relatively flat. My bench here has got kind of a soft matting on it. I want to put radio cabinets on it so it's not really flat enough so I want to build this all square so I thought I'll go and get a piece of wood to build it on that's why we've got that here. Peeling this protective film off this dye bomb material it's almost as satisfying as removing that film off the front of an LCD. I've got to admit not quite as satisfying but it is right up there. Oh, no. So I thought using this spinner material might cause quite a problem but it actually seems to have gone together okay because I say there is quite a big gap between these rails here because the material is 3mm and the gap's about 6 Now you can actually buy this material in different thicknesses. I think you can actually get 5mm which might have been better. I suspect 6mm may have gone in but it would have been a tight fit. Not sure. But I'm sure if I have to I can actually do something to take up that gap and that may be just something as simple as just putting a little bit of silicon in just to hold the panels into position and just stop them rattling around. But yeah I'm fairly happy that that went together actually quite nicely. 
I've just spotted one of those little manufacturing errors which creeps in. Now it's unfortunately I didn't spot this when I did the 3D modelling because it would have been obvious to me if I'd care to look for it. But the actual vertical column here, the piece of 2020 rail, it's actually blocking the top panel from sliding in all the way. So I'm going to have this problem on the top panel and the bottom panel. Now I could actually take this out, probably notch out the 2020 rail. Hmm. Certainly that would be one solution. I'm not sure whether that would be the easiest solution or not. Now I think I'm only going to have to do this on the top and the bottom panels. I think all the other rails should slot in as I actually intended. Let's try slotting that in now. Taking a close look at where I've notched it out, it's not absolutely perfect, but it isn't far off. Unfortunately, it is always going to be visible if you go looking for it. And of course, maybe the neater solution would have been to have cut a notch into the rail itself. Um, but to be honest, I just couldn't be bothered. So I've got the back panel from our misting enclosure that we milled out earlier. And I'm sure you'll agree that this thing really is a thing of beauty. Now of course it's very easy to drill round holes but where the CNC really comes into its own is the fact that we can actually cut these diagonal features and I think this is a first for me. Now I know lots of you at home just like me we've always made these type of back panels for equipment that we've built and it generally involves a lot of chain drilling and a lot of filing but the fact that the little CNC milling machine has actually just cut this out in one well, I, I've got to admit, I'm absolutely thrilled with it. I'm sure you'll agree it's lovely, isn't it? Let's try a connector in there. Yep, so as you can see, that one is actually a perfect fit. Now, this connector I actually drew myself, and so I, I actually knew the dimensions of it very precisely. Whereas I have tried one of the other connectors for size here, and it does fit the hole, but I actually think I found this particular connector. This is one that I downloaded from GrabCAD, so it has got just a little bit of slop in it, but it does line up perfectly with the uh, mounting holes. Let's try some of the other elements for size. So we've got a fuse holder that's going to go in there. And we've also got these aviation connectors which I'm going to use. That's a two pin one, don't want that one. That's a four pin, that's the one I plan to use. So this is going to take the command from the CNC to actually start the uh, the MIST system operating. And again, this isn't a round hole, it's actually got flats on the side of it to stop the connector rotating. And again, we've all done it, haven't we? We've all had to file these out and try to put the flats on them by hand. Well, the fact that I could actually just put that in on the milling machine and there you go, it's retained, it's, uh, it's done it. Isn't that wonderful? Now, unfortunately, I did actually make a little bit of a mistake here in that I've cut all these holes the same size because I was pretty sure that all of these connectors were what they call GX20s, but unfortunately, when I ordered this six pin connector off Amazon well I think I made a mistake I think that this one may be something like a GX18 basically it's 18 millimeters approximately rather than yeah that looks about right so that's an 18 mil connector whereas actually what I wanted was a 20 mil chassis mount connector so unfortunately I've ordered the wrong one now I did have a look on Amazon I was just going to buy another one and get it delivered overnight but unfortunately it does seem that the uh, the actual six pin connectors in the 20 mil, the GX 20 stroke sixes, they seem to be on fairly long lead times for some reason. So I think what I'm going to have to do is I'm not going to recut this whole back panel. That's going to be too much work for me. I just can't be bothered. So what I'm going to do instead is I think I'll 3D print some kind of space saver. It's, I'm going to print something which will just take up that slot there and present the this connector instead, which is, as you can see, it's just a little bit smaller. Now, although this connector is a little bit smaller and the physical connecting pins are also smaller, there's actually very little current going down this connector. It's about an amp or so to run the stepper motors and just a few hundred milliamps for switching that pneumatic solenoid on and off. So although the pins are small, the current carrying capacity is going to be absolutely fine. It is just a shame there that I, um, yeah, I just happened to choose the wrong one when I ordered these.
But as you can see, the fit for the rest of the connectors is absolutely perfect, so very happy with that. I think I'll start off by mechanically assembling all these connectors onto the back plate. And once we've done that, we'll go ahead and we'll wire it up. There's our back panel finish, nothing difficult, we'll slot this into place shortly. But before I do that we've got to go ahead and just install the power supply onto the bottom panel. Unfortunately they're not giving me a lot of room to play with so it's tweezer time. Just making out live neutral and earth connections. Beep. Beep. Beep, beep, and beep. I think I'm going to need a fuse. I'm guessing we don't have one, no. And I think that I'm going to go for a 2 amp time delayed fuse. So let's go ahead and plug in and we're going to test the very highest quality power supply that you can buy from Amazon for less than £6. Ready? Here goes. Well, got a little green LED. And my casing doesn't appear to be live to the touch, which is a good sign. Well, 24.06, winner, winner. Well, I was hoping to get this finished today, but unfortunately, the assembly has taken me a little bit longer than I expected, so I'm afraid there is going to be a part three, so I'm sorry about that. But before we do finish today, I actually want to go ahead and install our PCB into our enclosure. Now this is actually the part that's actually been worrying me the most because we've got a number of LEDs and potentiometers that have to line up and it's especially the threaded part on the potentiometer that has to poke through the front panel just enough for us to get a nut on but not too far. So actually all these different dimensions are quite difficult to do by hand but this is really the beauty of using a package like Fusion 360 where we can actually draw everything up in 3D and we can see where things will hit or in fact miss. So I've got a high degree of confidence that this PCB will fit. Anyway, famous last words, let's find out. I did have to swap out one of the components in the build which was simply these PCB pillars and the reason I've swapped these out and actually replaced them with some metal pillars is simply because I couldn't actually find a screw which would fit into the middle of them to actually bolt them down to our chassis here. I think I've probably had these for many years and I suspect they require some kind of imperial or a self-tapping screw the size of which I don't have but I did actually have some M3 metal pillars so that's what I'm going to use. So let's go ahead and assemble the PCB into this front panel. Just got to line up the shafts for the potentiometers and also the LEDs. Is it going to fit? This really is a moment of truth. I haven't tried this before. Okay, I think that's going in. Putting a washer just helps the front panel from not getting scratched up when we use a a socket to tighten this down. I'm not going to fully tighten them down now, I'm going to just make sure it all slots together first. So the LEDs do just push through into these holes. I'll probably just put some hot melt glue on to retain them, but they are actually a pretty tight fit into the holes. Oh, yep, I think we've got it. If that LED will go in, get in. So all we've got to do now is screw down the shafts on our potentiometers and put the knobs on and we can call her done. I 
And I've got a couple of very cheap knobs to put on it, so let's do that. I guess before finishing for today, we really should switch it on and check it works. So let's switch the power on. So it looks like the Arduino's powered up because I've got this little blinky light thing which just tells me the Arduino is actually working. Now at the moment I've got the switch set in the off position. If we flip the switch up it goes to CNC control. If I push the switch down that's manual control and it should just turn the coolant on. In fact let's just try turning these down first. So we've got a very fine coolant control there, it's set to pump very slowly. We can increase the speed of the coolant flow. I can see a red light on the air control solenoid, so that's switched on at the moment. But of course we can change the duty cycle of that air flow, so let's do that. As we've got it set now, it's delivering that air and coolant about every half a second. But we can further reduce that duty cycle, so let me have a go at that. Or we can make the coolant and air run constantly just by reducing the control. I think with everything working, for today, that'll do. So thanks for stopping by today and helping me in the workshop. And I hope to see you very soon. But until then, bye bye for now.